Hi, my name is Carla Schubiger and I'm an assistant professor at OSU in the biomedical science department. My research area of interest is infectious diseases in immunology of aquatic species, and I'm located at the Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport. Like most veterinary medicine colleges, my college does research that can be summarized under the One Health umbrella. The One Health paradigm is the interface of human, animal, and environmental health, and it shows that we are tightly connected by sharing the same environments. Now, almost every research field can contribute to that common goal of One Health. In a shared world, we don't only share the environment, but we also share diseases. Diseases that are transferable between humans and animals are called zoonotic diseases. And the agents can be bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungal agents. We can transmit, but also contract them by direct or indirect contact, um, or also via the food. So you've probably seen this photo quite often this year. This is COVID-19. It is a member of the big and common family of coronavirus. Virus, like all living organisms, have two life goals. The first one is to survive, and the second one is to produce progeny. For its survival goal, the virus needs cells to infect. Why, you might ask? The answer to this question is related to its size. Viruses are tiny organisms, many times smaller than bacteria. The secret to their size is that they travel very light in terms of what they carry along. For example, bacteria have all the recipes, tools, and the machinery to replicate themselves. However, in contrast, viruses simply carry their suitcases with a recipe book inside. The suitcase being this beautiful surface that encapsulates their genetic material, which is the recipe book. This simplicity enables them to be super, super tiny and light. Therefore, they can travel easily up to six feet across the air, while a much bigger and heavier bacteria would just plop to the ground right in front of you. But you cannot cook a meal with only a recipe book. You need ingredients, pots, and utensils. Therefore, the virus has to hijack your cells and use the tools and factories that are in your cells for its reproduction. Once it is in the cell, the virus often produces so much offspring that upon release, the cells die from the impact. On all the released virus progeny will find your next cell and therefore massively exploit the cells in your body and kill those cells quickly, leading to massive inflammation. But there is one key feature that will decide whether the virus can actually enter the cell or not. You remember all those nice red spikes on the surface of COVID-19? These are the specific proteins that are attachment pieces to a key lock system here in this red circle. The spikes are very specific to the virus and they only attach to very specific proteins, which in COVID-19 is called ACE2 receptors. Whether you can get infected or not by COVID-19, there is therefore related to whether your genetic information has the sequence information to build um, and present that receptor on your cell surface. Well, obviously humans have that genetic information, um, but what about marine mammals? And this is where the story gets really interesting. Researchers have looked at the public available genetic information of a variety of marine mammals and looked whether they carry the genetic information of the ACE2 receptor. And not surprisingly, that information is in there. This photo lists marine mammals um, and suggests what level of susceptibility they have to contract COVID-19 if they have virus contact. The yellow circles on the name tags um, stand for medium susceptibility, orange for high, and red suggests an even higher susceptibility than humans for COVID-19. This is not necessarily surprising because empirically we know that marine mammals have died of coronaviruses. But once again, I'd like to remind everyone that this was a prediction study based on publicly available genetic information. 
So while coronavirus are not very prevalent in aquatic animals, they have been so far reported in harbor seals, bottlenose dolphins, and beluga whales. The last two were in the gamma coronavirus genus and the first one in the alpha coronavirus. In the 80s, three harbor seals in an outdoor exhibit in the Marine Sea Aquarium suddenly died. Of course, there's no antibody test for marine mammals. So they test with antibody tests available for other animals because coronavirus are very common um, in production animals and in cats and dogs. And all these came back positive. So cat owners might be familiar with the second one, uh, the FIP virus, which is feline infectious peritonitis virus. This is a deadly uncurable disease in cats. It happens when a non-harmful feline coronavirus variant mutates into the feline infectious peritonitis virus. So while the reservoir for the harbor seal coronavirus is thought to be in bats, it is however likely that cats that had access to the outdoor exhibits um, had transferred to coronavirus. Also cetaceans um, have died from coronavirus. A 13 year old captive born beluga whale died after a short illness suffering from lung and liver disease. And there's also a new report of bottlenose dolphins dying from coronavirus. In both these instances, birds are connected to this disease transmission. As far as beta coronavirus, um, that has not yet actually been reported in marine mammals, but this group contains the very lethal human coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. Again, bats are likely the reservoir um, or the place where um, a coronavirus mutated and then suddenly was able to infect um, people. So the question now might become, um, can humans become a reservoir for beta coronaviruses? Um, particularly when looking at how many million people are shedding COVID-19 via the waste in the environment, this is, I think, um, a reasonable question. We are now widely testing human sewage for COVID-19. Human sewage contamination is still an issue in the U.S. At our coast, for example, it can become an issue in shellfish harvest after heavy rains and flooding. But an even bigger problem might be um, in developing or underdeveloped countries with poor sanitation. Therefore, I don't think it's far-fetched to think that this could become an issue in our marine mammals. Also, as you have seen in the previous slide, birds, while not getting sick, they can transmit coronavirus. Hmm, birds trans transmitting uh, a virus sound familiar to you? it really should. Looking at past events with influenza, um, this is not a far-fetched idea. And influenza associated ATAP virus H797 wasn't able to kill birds, but mutated enough to find a reservoir in New England seal population in the 1980s. Also Northern elephant seals in California turned serologically positive with a influenza A after um, the human flu season with that A-type, um, indicating that humans likely pass the flu virus on to those seals. Lastly, another example is influenza B virus, which has strictly been a human pathogen, with no previous known reservoir recognized in nature. However, um, more recently, it seems that influenza type B has been transmitted to seal populations um, which, while not dying from influenza B infection, they could therefore very likely become an active reservoir for human infections. And with that, I'll let you answer this hypothetical question whether COVID-19 in marine mammals is really a thing. You can answer that yourself. Um, however, I do like to advocate for not only thinking about your health when handling wildlife, but also the population health of animal species that you might be handling. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.